Today, December the 31st, 2023. How many know what date that is? Today, right? It's today. There is no other day but today. And what a great day it is to be in church. It's a great place to spend the last day of 2023. I honestly can't imagine a better place to end the year than with the family of God and with my NLA family. Great place to spend the last day of the year. Now, I want you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor that the year, this year is not over yet. Just tell them that. Okay. <coughs> Tell somebody sitting on the other side. Do you know that the year is not over yet? I mean, we're like, I bet you half of you have probably already tuned out. You're already thinking about 12 o'clock, midnight. You're already thinking about tomorrow. But can I tell you that the year is not over yet? We have at least 13-ish hours left. You know, when we get to December 31st, most of us already start thinking about the new year. We start thinking about what is to come. We want to think about the year that, that's ahead of us. We wonder what it will bring. Where we will be at midnight. Maybe you're even considering what your New Year's resolution will be, if you have one. But I have great news. The year's not over yet. The year's not over yet, so don't get too excited about the new year, because this year's not done. And I I, I think sometimes we get so excited about something that's coming, instead of living in the day. Do you know there's still time for God to give you a miracle? There's still time for God to heal you. There's still time for God to deliver and save and bring home somebody who's been far from the Lord. There's still time today for God to deliver you from your sin and your addictions. There's still time for God to do something today. And sometimes we, we want to rush ahead. We want, we want to get it on, on, you know, well, maybe next year. But there's still time today. Maybe there's still time for you to reconcile with somebody you have a broken relationship with. We're we're quick to want to end the year, to to hope for a better year. I know what you're thinking, Pastor, like you're nuts. You know, can we just talk about 2024? No, because this year's not done yet. And maybe you think I'm a little crazy or nuts, but that's okay. I've been called worse. And I've been called crazy and nuts before, so it's not something new. I really want you to enjoy these next 13 hours. Because God is not finished with you this year. And sometimes we get so excited, we want to move on. We just want to get to the next day. And maybe it's because this year's been really crappy. Maybe you've had a horrible year and you're just kind of like, I just want the new year to come. Can I just tell you, God's not done. And no matter how good or bad your year has been, God can make this day the most important day of your life. It can be the most important day of your life. You know, we can consider all the plans that we have for the new year, but they do not compare to what God has planned for you. It doesn't matter what your plans are. It doesn't matter what you thought you were going to do. It doesn't matter what you think next year is going to be. God has a plan, and it's better than anything you could ever decide. Do you know that even being here this morning is part of God's plan? 
You may have thought, well, I'm just going to church because that's what I do on Sunday. Can I tell you that's not the case? God has a plan for you, and He brought you here this morning for a reason, because He wants to speak to you. And you know, sometimes we're like, oh, God, God wants to speak to my neighbor. God wants to speak to you. It's not by chance or coincidence. You see, God has something for you this morning, and I believe God's here. God, you're here today because God wants to speak to you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God wants to speak to you? You see, sometimes we come to church with no anticipation, no expectation of God speaking to us. We have no, no even thought that He's going to. We just show up because that's what we always do on Sunday morning. You see, I honestly believe God's not looking for people that are looking for tomorrow. He's looking for people that want to live in the day, in this moment. I, I, I think sometimes we, we think about the things down the road. We think about the future. And, and there are some things that are really good that are coming. Jesus is coming back. That's a thing we need to be looking for. But we need to live in the present today and with that in mind, but not looking to that and forget what's happening right now. You see, today is the day. Today's the day. I know God will work out tomorrow. Tomorrow's His problem, not mine. I was sharing with Elizabeth, I've had a week. It's been a week. There are things that happened this week, I'm just like, really God? Like, but today's the day. Not last night, not yesterday, not Friday or Thursday or Wednesday. Today is the day and not tomorrow. Because tomorrow may not come. I hate to tell you this, you're not guaranteed tomorrow, just so you know. You see, we have two modes as human beings. We have this mode, we, we look to the past. We look back and we go, oh, wasn't it wonderful? It was so wonderful back then. July of this coming year in 2024, on July the 7th, we will celebrate the 40th anniversary of this church and we will look back. We will look back at the things that God has done. We will look back at the pastors and the leaders and, the, and the, the people who have come through here that God has ministered to and changed. But can I tell you, we cannot live in the past. And it doesn't matter what God did in 2023. It doesn't matter what He's going to do in the future. Because these are the two ways we look. We either look back or we look forward. Can I just tell you, we need to look at today. How often do you think or talk about today? You know, it's like, well, you know, next week, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to sleep. Watch a little football, have something to eat. Tomorrow is what I'm thinking about. A lot of us live there. We don't think about the present. We think about what's going to happen later. Or we look back to the past and we go, oh, wasn't it great? But all we have is today. You can't change the future, the past, and you cannot know if the future is even a given. All you have is today. The present is the only thing we can have that we can be have sure of. And God is the only one that knows it all, and He's the only one that can guarantee it. He's the only one. Now, I just want to give you a perspective about God for a moment before I get into the message. But I, I just want you to think about this. First and, more, for, first and foremost, God never changes. He is always the same. The same. Look at what James says. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So if, you, if every perfect gift is from God, right? But it says, comes down from the Father of the, heav of the heavenly lights who does not change like shift shifting shadows. God does not change. You change. The people around you change. If you're a teenager, you probably change every 10 minutes. Especially if you're junior high. 
You may say, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, I, I youth pastor for 15 years. Ten of those years, I dealt with junior highs. That's it. I had 40 junior highs. And I'll tell you, their, their emotions, their opinions changed every five minutes, if not every other minute. And girls were even worse. <laughs> Boys didn't really change that much until they were like 15, 16. Girls, from like the time they're 12 to 14, they, they one minute can love you, the next minute hate you, the next minute don't care if you, you even exist, and then love you again. It's like crazy. And that could all happen in about the same amount of time as I took to say it. But God does not change. He doesn't. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Psalms 102, 27, but you remain the same and your years will never end. How many know your years will end? Hebrews 1, 12, you will roll them up. Now, this passage is talking about the heavens and the earth. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, He is not going to change. He is never changing. God is the same. And so if He says something, guess what? He means it. God doesn't change His mind. You know, I, I love people who say, well, you know, God changes His mind. God does not change His mind. God always knows what His plan is. He has not changed His plan. He's not going to change His plan. He has a plan. And He sticks to His plan. And He will never go against His nature. And His nature is that He would never lie. So guess what? God doesn't change His mind. You might change your mind. You probably have changed your mind just this morning. You probably changed your mind in getting dressed. Well, what am I wearing today? Maybe you made up your mind last night what you were going to wear today, but then you got up this morning and decided, that's not really what I want to wear. See, God's never changing. Tomorrow will come with tomorrow, will come with tomorrow but today He is here. One of the problems we have is we're always looking to God to do something tomorrow. We're always thinking, well, what's, what's He going to do tomorrow? What's he going to do today? Are you expecting God to do something today? Are you expecting God to show up today in your life? You see, when we come to the end of a year, we're always looking forward instead of taking the moment and experiencing today. You know, maybe you're, you'll say, well, I'll read the Bible later, or I'll pray later, or I'll, I'll try it tomorrow. Sometimes we have the wrong attitude about things. We say, I have to go to church. I have to pray. I have to read the Bible. I have to love people. I have to give. Can I just tell you that is wrong thinking? It's not even good thinking. It's, it's not even healthy thinking. You should be thinking this way. I get to go to church. I get to pray, I get to talk to the Father, I get to give, I get to share, I get to love other people, I get all these things because of Him. So now we'll get into the sermon. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Today. Today. Do you realize that today is the day that the Lord has made? You notice it doesn't say tomorrow is the day that the Lord has made? Because when tomorrow comes, it will be today. Do you know that tomorrow never comes? Tomorrow never comes. You can write it on your calendar. Tomorrow will never come because tomorrow when it comes, it will be today and tomorrow will be still coming. We never get to tomorrow. It's always today.
Are you glad for today? Do you rejoice in today? Do you know that today is the day of salvation? Today is the day of God's favor? Do you know that God has, he wants to show his favor towards you today? Not next week, not tomorrow, not next year. Today. Look what Paul said to the Corinthians. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Not next week. You know, we're always looking till next, you know, the next day or the next week or the next month. Only if God would do this. Can I just say God can do it today? He can do it today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What day? This day. The day of salvation is today. Do you know that, that your contract with God is a one-day contract? Now think about this. You have a one-day contract with God. It's for today. And when tomorrow comes, you have a new contract for one day. God is not making a contract for the next 10 years and saying, hey, you're here for 10 years. You have a one-day contract. That's it. Today. And it runs out at midnight and you get a new one. And then God signs the second one and he says, hey, you got another day. I've given you another day because you're not done yet. One day there'll be a day when the contract will be up and God will say, hey, it's time to come home. But that may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be next week, it may be for another 30 years, who knows. But the reality is you have a contract for today, today. Nobody is guaranteed anything about tomorrow. If you woke up and you're breathing today, this is the only day you got guaranteed. This is the day. Now, maybe as Christians, we understand that our, our, our day is related to our relationship with Christ. But can you just imagine for a moment, this is the day that the Lord has made. You see, many people, when we get to this day in the calendar year, they start thinking about next, the next day. They have already stopped thinking about today. Like when they woke up this morning, many of them are thinking about, what am I going to be doing at midnight? Some of you in the room will be sleeping, I'm sure. Probably I will be, maybe. I know Pastor Steve won't be sleeping. <laughs> you know, th there are some things I, I do not miss about youth ministry. I, I love teenagers. I love hanging out with them. I love spending time with them. They're awesome. But I don't want to stay up all night with them. I, I'm so thankful my brother enjoys that. I don't. <laughs> It's not, it, you know, there's, there's, there has come to a point where I, I want to go to sleep. I'm getting old. <laughs> what a friend, what a friend. You see, many people are already reflecting about our past. We're looking back or they're looking forward. They've made their New Year's resolutions. Okay, how many of you, by a show of hands, have thought about what you're going to make a New Year's resolution about? Any of you? No one? That's awesome. Can I tell you there's no point because today is the day? Today is the day. You know, many people are thinking about this last year and all the things that have happened. Some are good, some are bad, some are kind of like, well, it was okay. Maybe you're hoping that the gas price will go down tomorrow. Don't count on it. Maybe you're thinking that, you know, tomorrow will be a new day, so it'll be different. Can I just tell you, stop living in the future, stop living in the past, let's consider today. Do you know that today is a gift? It is a gift from God. It's a gift. Today is a gift. 
You've been given a gift. It's called today. What will you do with that gift? I'm, I'm, I'm happy you came to church. But let me ask you this. What's your plans for the rest of the day? Like, like you know, for some, they'll have a nap so that they can, you know, stay up all night with teenagers. Youth leaders. You probably need a nap this afternoon, just in case you don't know. We need to understand where God dwells. You see, God doesn't live in the time frames you live in. God lives outside of time and space. He doesn't live in, 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 the, in the same pl plane as you do. You see, you're affected by the calendar. You're affected by a clock. Well, most of you are affected by the clock. Some of you struggle to read a clock, I think, but, you know... I'm just saying. Yet God doesn't look at those things. God always dwells in the present. He exists in, in all of it, but He dwells in the present. He resides in you. He resides in me. God dwells in the present. And every day that you have been given is a gift. And you may say, well, why is it a gift? Well, it's because the Lord made this day. God gave you a day. He made another day so that you could live. Another day that you could spend time with your family. Another day on this earth. You know, how many, how many of you think the earth is beautiful? It's okay, you know. It, I mean, if you've ever seen the mountains or the, or the rocky coastlines of the East Coast or, or the the prairies, or even Ontario itself. I mean, this, this country is gorgeous. And what I think is amazing about that is it's so beautiful, and yet it's broken. Think about this. When man fell, it affected everything. The earth became broken. You know how we're talking about the environment and we're going to save the planet? Folks, we are not going to save this planet. We can do all we want to try to save it, but at the end of the day, God is going to roll it up and put it away, and He's going to say, I'm done. And make a new heaven and a new earth. And can you imagine what the new heaven and the new earth is going to be like? If this is broken and it's beautiful, can you imagine what unbroken earth would look like? You see, this is a day. This is a gift from God. You've got today. The Lord that created everything on the earth and in it and around it gave you this day. The Lord that created you and all that you are. And every day that the Lord gives you your life, He has purpose on that day and the moment to dwell with you. You know, we celebrated Christmas just a week ago. We celebrated the Lord's birth. One of the names that was given to Jesus Christ was Emmanuel, the Lord with us. Can I tell you, He hasn't left you? He demonstrated in His coming, and Jesus promised His disciples that even after He ascended into heaven, He would send the Holy Spirit to be with us forever. Where does He dwell? In us. When? Presently. And forever. You know, sometimes we, we, we forget that, that, you know, God is present right now. God is present right now. He knows everything about you. He knows what you're thinking. He knows how tired you are. He knows how wide awake you are, how rested you are. He knows everything about you. He knows when you're going to have to go to the bathroom. I know that sounds pretty weird, but, but the reality is God knows everything. And sometimes we think, you know, God isn't here. Well, you know, He is here. Those nights, you know, those X amount of hours that the youth are going to be here overnight and, and Pastor Steve and the youth leaders are going to have to deal with. God knows what's going to happen tonight, guys. 
He knows. He knows how many people are going to fall asleep. He knows how many people you're going to have to wake up. He knows how many people are going to act stupid, how many people are going to be great. He knows how many are going to feel sick, how many will eat too much. He knows all of it. And sometimes we, we just kind of like write God off and we pretend like he doesn't know. He knows everything. You see, God dwells in the present. God dwells in the day. Now, you all know what this is, right? You should have one in your car or your vehicle. And every once in a while, you should look in it, just in case. Just saying. But the most important time to use this is when you're backing up. If you don't use this, you might hit something. I'm just saying, you might. You see, it's a rear view mirror. The purpose of it is to help alert you to the things behind you, things that may be going by you on the side, coming around you. It's there to help you when you back up so you don't hit something. But if you drove your car only looking in the rear view mirror, can I tell you there will be serious consequences? <laughs> serious. You will end up in a ditch on a very flat, paved road where there's no reason to end up in a ditch. We were coming back from Thunder Bay on, on Wednesday, and there was a car in the ditch, and I was trying to figure out how he ended up in the ditch on a straight piece of road that was clear and dry, and yet he was in the ditch. And he was there, like, still there, like the police had just shown up, and he was standing beside his car in the ditch, and I was thinking, how did you end up there? Probably not looking where he was going, probably on his phone, or maybe he was looking in the rearview mirror instead of looking where he was going. You see, there's nothing wrong with the mirror. It has a purpose. The problem is, is if we spend all of our time looking in it, we're in trouble. And when it comes to our spiritual life, there's nothing wrong with reflecting on the past. But often we live there. We, we talk about, oh, it was so much better when I was growing up. You know, we, we, we say, oh, well, you know, man, was I so fit back in the day. I was pretty, pretty, pretty good. We live thinking about the past and never really enjoying the, the present. Oh, I, I had the best job. You should have seen the house I lived in. I mean, it was just so good. The good old days. You know, can I tell you that the good old days weren't always as good as we remember? Ask the, Egyptian, or the Israelites. You know, they get outside of Egypt and they're saying, oh, the good old days, back in Egypt, you know, when we had food. They forgot they were in slavery. They forgot that they were being punished. They forgot that they had slave masters. You know, we, we sometimes look at the past and we glorify it and we think it's so amazing. But can I just tell you, it's not always as good as we thought. And sometimes we look to the future thinking, oh, it's going to be better. Oh, it's going to be so much better. You see, maybe your past isn't great. And so when you look back, all you have is pain. All you think about is the, the negative things that have happened. So you don't want to look back. There's lots of people that, that don't use a rear view mirror. They use one of these. They're looking forward, but they're looking so far forward, they can't see what's right in front of them. They don't see the present. They don't see what's going on. <coughs> We're so caught up looking into the future that we don't enjoy the present. Now, these are great. They, they serve great purposes. Uh, if you live on the lake and you're trying to see you know, the bird in the middle of the lake, you can look and see what kind of bird it is. Or maybe you go to a ball game and you're sitting in the 500 levels because you're cheap and you can't afford a, 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 
you know, you can't afford a, a ticket near the field. So now you're using binoculars to see the field because that's the only way you're going to see it because you're so far up. They call them nosebleed section. You know why, right? Because if you go too high, your nose starts to bleed. Well, that's kind of the way it is if you're in the 500 level of most, most fo uh, baseball, football stadiums, even hockey arenas to some degree, some of the newer ones. But here's the thing. You're up there, you're watching the game, everything's good. The binoculars serve a purpose. But can I just tell you, when you get down to your car, you should not be using them to drive home. Right? It's not safe. And yet some people actually treat their spiritual life that way. They're always looking forward, oh, when God does this, when God's going to do that, if God does this, can I just tell you, you need to ask God, what are you doing right now? What's the present thing you're doing in my life? You see, there's nothing wrong with looking forward. It can cause us to be optimistic. We can always think of the days ahead being better. But it can also make you really nervous about the future. You know, if you look at our world today, you'd say, oh, the world, it's coming, you know, it's coming unglued at the hinges and, and things are falling apart. Can I just tell you, it doesn't matter how bad it gets, God's still on the throne. And can I also tell you this, for God to, to return, for Jesus to come back, it's going to get worse. And sometimes we, we, we want God to fix everything. You know what? I don't want Him to fix anything. I want Him to come back. You may say, well, pastor, that's pretty pessimistic. No, it's, it's not. I want God to come back, and it has to get worse for God to show up. For Jesus to return. The world needs to be a mess. So don't get excited or, or worried or fearful. He is in control. He still sits on the throne. He's still in charge. Where does God want us to look? He wants us to look at this day, the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Have you ever noticed when you're stressed or worried, it's usually not about right then, right that moment? It's not about what's happening at that moment. It's about either what's happened in the past or what's going to happen in the future. We get stressed over things we should not worry about. So I, I want to give you three things that I want, you be, I want to encourage you to put into your life every day. Starting today. Starting right now. These are three things that you need to do to stay in the present and not get caught up in the future or the past. First and foremost, we need to seek Him and trust Him. Do you know sometimes the reason we look forward or we look back is because we don't trust God for the present. We think that God's going to do it down the road. Today is the gift from the Lord. For you to seek Him, to trust Him. That's the number one reason why you're here. Is to trust Him. To seek Him. God wants to meet with you. God wants to be with you. God desires to have you as His children. God's desire is for you. Not anything on this earth. You know, He's going to roll this earth up and put it away. But He's not going to do that to you. And, and you know, sometimes I, we really get kind of caught up in this. We're so caught up in, in what the future holds. I want you to read this. I'm going to read this, but, but look what it says. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or what your body, or, or about your body, what you will wear. It's not, li it's not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them, than they? 
Can any one of you by worry add a single hour to your life? Why do you worry about clothes? Now, that's, you know, in general, right? He's not talking about not wearing clothes. Um, You need to wear clothes. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the, gra- clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Now Jesus is the one speaking this. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Do you hear that? God already knows your needs. You notice it doesn't say God knows your wants. He does know your wants too, but that doesn't matter to Him as much as your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Today's trouble is enough for today. You notice it doesn't say today's blessings are enough for today. Do you know, sometimes we think, I, I, I don't know why, why we do, but as humans, sometimes we think that we get saved and everything's going to be perfect. And no more problems, no more sickness, no more challenges. Everything's going to be wonderful. It's going to be so wonderful because I got saved. Can I just tell you, that is a lie from the pit. Do you see what it says there? Today's trouble is enough for today. So you might have trouble today. You might. Do you know that trouble comes to everyone? The rain falls on the just and the unjust. God isn't isn't like, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to send him any trouble because, you know, he's not going to send you trouble. But here's the thing. He's going to walk through the trouble with you. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. In other words, what are you sweating about? What are you sweating about in your life? Who are you going to marry? Where are you going to go to school? What kind of grades you're going to get? What kind of job you're going to have? What kind of income is going to to be developed? Where Where you're going to live? Where you're going to go? How your kids are going to turn out? Can I tell you, there is no point worrying about your kids. And every parent in the room just said, but I always worry about my kids. Yeah, you should, but the reality is, God's got them in His hands. You see, He's telling you this for a reason. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It's not life. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? You see, God's taking care of it. God's got your life in His hands. The question is, are you presently walking with Him in a way that you actually hear from Him? You see... I think sometimes the reason we struggle and we always look to the, to the future or, or look back to the past is because we are, we are struggling with our relationship right this minute. We all struggle with our relationship with God. If you're in this room and you have a relationship with God, I can guarantee there will be struggle in that relationship because we are not perfect like He is. And we want it our way. We want the relationship our way. It's the way I should do it. This is the way it should happen. God, you should do it this way. Can I just tell you God's not going to do it your way? He's going to do it His way? So you better get over that thinking that your way is right. Your way isn't right. It may make you feel good, but it's not right. His way is right. Whatever He decides. 
You need to walk in step with Him, not wanting Him to walk in step with you. Look at what he said in, in, in chapter 10. I mean, not one sparrow falls to the ground without your father knowing about it. Now think about that, folks. Have you ever seen the size of a sparrow? Every, every hair on your head that's left <laughs> is numbered. And all the ones that have fallen out and are coming back, they were numbered too. I mean, just think about it. God knows everything about you. He's not unaware of your challenges. He's not unaware of your problems. He's not unaware of your joy. He's not under, unaware of what you want and what you don't want. And sometimes he gives you what you don't want because you need it. It's okay to say, ouch. Because the reality is sometimes God allows things in your life that you need that you don't want because God is working on you. God is working on changing you. God is working on making you a better person. God is working, you, working on you to be more like Him. In verse 33, he says, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what's the command here? What is it? Seek what? Seek his kingdom. His kingdom. When are we to seek it? First, right? It says, seek my kingdom first. And then, when? Today. Not tomorrow. Don't seek his kingdom tomorrow. Today. Seek him today. You know, it's interesting in the Lord's Prayer, he, he tells the disciples, right, to pray. And he says, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, and that's really saying, Lord, let your reign and rule in my life. We're seeking you, we're seeking your face, we want what you want. You know, many times we go to God and we tell Him everything we want. We got a list, you know. God, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And, and you know, we live wanting instead of living today. Um, I saw this, this illustration of, of, you know, the difference between living in the present and living in the future. So, you say to God, well, I want a husband, or I want a wife. I want a spouse. God, I want a spouse. I want a spouse. I want a spouse. But instead of living in the present, getting yourself ready for that spouse, you just keep wanting a spouse. God wants to make you better so that you can be a good spouse. You know? Maybe that's not the only reason. Maybe, maybe God doesn't have a spouse for you. Maybe God's plan isn't for you to be married. But the reality is we spend so much time wanting and very little time preparing. Have you ever noticed nobody learns to ride a bike by looking at the bike in a garage? Right? You don't learn to ride a bike by, by looking at it. You don't learn to ride a bike by some PowerPoint presentation showing you how. And as much as you can go on YouTube and watch and learn how to ride a bike, it's really not until you sit down on the bike, you put your feet on the pedals, and you actually start pedaling, and you wiggle and wobble. How many, how many have ever had to teach your child how to ride a bike? Do you know, chances are, if they're ever going to ride a bike, they are going to fall. It's, it's a given. 
It takes practice. It takes, you know, trial and error. It, it, it requires some skill sets that you just don't have until you do it. The reality is sometimes we, we ask God for something, but we never prepare for that thing to come. And we live in, in this futuristic thing. Oh, God's going to do... Well, you know what? Maybe He's not. Maybe He's waiting for you to get ready. And the only place you can get ready is right now in the present. You can't get ready next week. Because guess what? Next week will come and there will be no, no thing there that you want. God is always working in the present, never working in the future. He already knows the future. He doesn't have to work over there. He's working right here, right now with you. It's interesting, too, that we see uh, Jesus. Jesus, you know, was always going to the Father. He was always seeking out God's kingdom. He was always seeking the Father. We see it throughout the Scriptures. You know, Jesus was always about His Father's business. He was always looking to see what was going to happen. Always checking in. When was the last time you checked in with the Father? Jesus, Matthew chapter 1, verse 35, or Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and went to a solitude place where He prayed. He sought out the Father. After feeding the 5,000, he sent the crowd away and sent his disciples in a boat. What did he do? He went up on the mountainside and spent the whole night doing what? Seeking his Father. What does he do when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane before he is put on the cross, before he's trialed, before he's accused, before he is killed? He goes to the Garden and he prays and spends time with the Father. Seek first this kingdom. Jesus constantly was seeking out the Father. Can I just tell you, you and I need to seek the Father more than we do. And not tomorrow. Today. And Jesus isn't the only one in the Bible who sought out the Father. Joshua was, was always seeking after God. In Joshua 3, 5, he says this, I mean, after 40 years of waiting in the land, right? Waiting for the promised land, God tells Joshua to go. And Joshua says to the people, this is what he says, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. Consecrate yourself, get ready for tomorrow. Consecrate yourself. The Lord will do wonders among you. Consecrate yourself for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. In other words, consecrate yourself when? Today. Because tomorrow, God's going to show up and do something crazy. You know what? You want God to do something tomorrow? Then get ready today. Don't wait till tomorrow, because you know what? Tomorrow will never come. Get ready today. Do you know Moses sought the Father as well? We see in Psalms chapter 90, which Moses wrote in verse 14, it says, Oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all these days. You see, each one of them, Moses, he sought God in the morning. Joshua sought God in the morning. And Jesus sought God in the morning. Now, I'm not a morning person. My wife will tell you, I, I, I don't necessarily like the morning. I'm not a morning. I don't, I don't wake up at five and go, whoa, the morning's here. And some of you probably do. You probably enjoy the morning, and, and I'm really happy for you. But there's a reason that they did it in the morning. They sought the Father. It was the first thing they did. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? Now, if you get up at noon, then seek the Father. If you get up at Five in the morning, seek the Father. Seek out God whenever you get up. Don't wait till the end of the day and go, okay, well, I, I didn't talk to God. I, maybe I should talk to Him now. We, we need to live in the present, not tomorrow. 
So if you're seeking God at midnight before you go to sleep, guess what? Tomorrow's going to come and you're not ready. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first His kingdom. You know, I love this. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I'll take care of everything. That's basically what God's saying. Just seek me. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of, the, of your life. I can help you walk through this. I can get you through it. Guess what? I'll take care of everything. You just seek me. So number one thing you have to do is seek him. That's the first thing you, you need to do. <coughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. God wants us to trust Him and seek Him and to spend time with Him today. The other thing is this. You have to choose to make the most of every opportunity that comes your way. Now, you may say, Pastor, I, I don't even see the opportunities coming my way. It's probably true. Most of us are unaware of what God is doing. Sometimes we are so unaware that God shows up, He does something, and we kind of go, wow, how'd that happen? Look what Ephesians says. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Do you know, uh, if all you do is spend your time looking at the evil days and going, oh, it's so evil, you're not going to accomplish much. Can I just say, let's get our focus back on Him and less on the world, and we might find that things actually go better because we're focusing on who, who is actually in charge of the day instead of those who are messing the day up. You see, if we, spe if we seek God out, we spend time seeking Him, guess what happens? We actually have a mindset that is more in line with Him than in line with our own flesh. You know, I always, I, always, I always think it's interesting, you know, there's that passage that says that God will give you the desires of your heart. And I, I love that passage, but I don't like the way it's usually preached. It's usually preached this way. God will give you the desires of your heart, just ask. Can I just tell you that's not even biblical? God says, do my commands, follow my commands, be obedient to me, listen to my words, seek my face, and guess what? Then all the desires of your heart I'll give you. Why? Because you will be in line with Him, and your desires will line up with what He has planned, not what your flesh wants. And the reality is, some, it's been preached so poorly, so many places, that so many people have walked away from God because God, they didn't get the desire of their heart. Can I tell you that God's plan for you is to know Him? That's His plan. It's not anything else. And if your heart isn't desiring Him, guess what? You're not going to get the desires of your heart. You're going to get messed up. But the moment you start walking and desiring Him, guess what? The things that you desire will be more in line with who He is and what He wants for your life. You know, I'm pretty sure. Look at this. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Now this is what God says about, about us. Now here's an interesting thing. Do you know that nobody has shown up in heaven? No one has shown up in heaven and God said, oh, what are you doing here? You weren't expected. No one. You see, God knows the days you have. He knows how many more days you have. Nobody arrives in heaven. What are you doing here? You know, it may be tragic on earth when someone passes away, but I can promise you that when someone dies, it's the right time. No matter what we think. Because it's God's time. God's got it in, in control. God's got it planned out. God knows when that person's going to arrive in heaven. He's not surprised by it. He's not, he's not like, oh, wait a sec, you're not on the list for today. God's not in that business. God knows everything. 
And the reality is, you don't know how long you have. I don't know how long I have. You may be sitting here and saying, Pastor, this is really depressing now. Uh, can we talk about something that's like exciting? Well, I just want you to know this. You have today. The year's not over. You have today. And guess what? Today's a good day. Because the Lord made it. Today's a good day. Tomorrow might not be a good day. Today's a good day. You have a choice today to seek the Lord. You have a choice today to trust Him. You have a choice today to seize the moment of the day. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be so worried about the past and don't be thinking about the future. Dwell presently with Jesus today. Today. Now the last thing, the last thing is this, and that is God has called you to rejoice and be glad in it. You see, if you trust God and seek His kingdom and seize the moment, take every opportunity and, and use it for His kingdom, I promise you it will be easy to rejoice and be glad in it. See, this is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul says this to the Philippian church. And I, I don't know about you, but I think sometimes we, we, uh, we don't really appreciate what Paul wrote. You know, to rejoice is exceedingly abundant joy. Thankful for what I'm, where I'm at. It doesn't mean that I have to be thankful for every circumstance that happens to me. It means I rejoice in what is happening with God, not my circumstances. Do you know, I don't think anyone really wants something bad to happen to them. God is present and He's working it together for good even when things go wrong. It doesn't mean if you have a car accident and get severely hurt that you, that you can praise God that I'm severely hurt. You may not have chosen that, but you can still praise God in the present and be excited about who He is. Do you know that God can use that to open doors for other people? You ever notice when Christians go through difficult times, they have exceeding great joy on the inside. It stirs their faith. Has that ever happened? You, you see somebody, they're going through something, and they, they still have joy in their life. And they're, and they're like just trusting God, even in the midst of tragedy. I, I experienced that a number of times. I've experienced it over and over uh, in hospital rooms, sitting beside somebody who's passing away, who's going through a hardship, and yet God is still on the throne in their life. They're still rejoicing, even in the midst of death. You see, there is something that happens in us when we start to seek Him and we stop thinking about us. And I'll tell you, I... I there are many times that I've, I've experienced that where, you know, somebody has said something or done something and it's just caused my faith to grow. Because they're going through something and I think, oh, you know, I have no reason to complain. I'll never forget uh, spending time with Peter Spade and him, praying, him saying to me, you know, Pastor, just pray that God's will be done. I'm okay either way. Whether I go to be with him or I'm here, I'm okay. I remember him, and he would say to me, just pray. Pray God's will be done. And I, I listened to him, and I was so encouraged by his faith. You know, I shared a, a few weeks back, you know, one of, one of the, the, the young people who were in our youth group in Edmonton, and who's now an adult and has children, and their daughter's been diagnosed with a rare disease, and and you know, she may not make it to her 12th birthday. 
And he shared this with me. And as he's sharing, he's saying, you know, but I'm trusting God. If God doesn't heal her, I'm still okay with God. Because he has a plan. I was so encouraged by his faith in the midst of it. He's being told his daughter's not going to live to be 12 years old. She's got this rare disease that's affecting her brain and her nervous system, and, and she literally will, her brain will become mush if God doesn't intervene. And he's like, you know, Pastor, I don't understand why this is happening, but I'm trusting him. You see, that kind of thing stirs me. It causes my faith to grow. When you think about yourself, how could you handle it? But you're watching people handle it with grace. You see, they've made a choice to seek and trust God even in the midst of circumstances that don't say they should. They've chosen to rejoice in the Lord even in the midst of overwhelming circumstances. You see, it's your choice to choose to rejoice today. It's your choice to rejoice in the midst of trial. It's your choice to choose to rejoice and worship Him even if everything seems like it's falling apart. Maybe you're sitting here and you're going, oh, pastor, that's a great sermon. Come on. Can I just tell you, it's not for tomorrow. It's for today. You have to make the choice today to rejoice. Do you know that the word blessed in the Bible can also be translated happy? Now just, just bear with me for a moment. Blessed are the poor. Happy are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Happy are the meek. You see, there's a big difference sometimes in how we think things through. Are you happy just because something great happened? Are you, are you joyful because something happened? Because listen, when Paul wrote this passage, rejoice in the Lord always, I say again, rejoice. He was in prison in chains. He wasn't enjoying a nice big house. He wasn't enjoying, you know, a, a coffee at the, at the, on the dock at, by a nice lake. He was actually in prison in chains when he wrote this to the Philippian church. He said, even in this, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. At any moment, they could chop his head off, and yet he's saying, rejoice. I don't know. I, maybe you wouldn't be able to do that. I don't think I could. I, I'm like, okay, God, like, get me out of here. And he's saying, rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice, 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 rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. He actually said, for me, for, for me to live as Christ or to die is a gain. Are you living in fruitful service for the Lord? I don't care what's going on. I'm going to rejoice because He is Lord. See, joy does not come based on your circumstances. Joy, joy does not come because you're doing everything right. Joy does not come because everything is perfect. Joy comes because we rest and trust Him. And you can rejoice in Him. And again, I say rejoice. He, he says it twice, right? He says, I'll, I'll say it again. In case you didn't hear me the first time. Look at what it says after that. It says, let your gentleness be evident to all that the Lord is near. You know, um, Have you ever let your gentleness not be gentle? You know, God has called you to be gentle with others. Sometimes we're not. 
Sometimes we're pretty harsh. Sometimes we can be very mean. But see, when we rejoice, even in the midst of trial, even in the tough times, there is something that happens to us. Because God is working out in our lives. Paul goes on after he says, right, he says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. Then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. But then he says this, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition for thanksgiving, present your request to God. Are you thankful? Are you thankful? You see, because God is, is really at work in your life, whether you realize it or not. I think sometimes we miss out on what God is doing because we're too busy looking forward. We're too busy looking down the road and wondering what's going to come. And he's saying, what about right now? Right now. Is he speaking to your heart right now? How many of you have looked at the weather for the next week? or the next day, wondering what tomorrow is going to be like. Can I just tell you, for the next 14 days, the lowest temperature we're going to have during the day is about minus 14. Maybe, if that happens, about a week from now. At least that's what the weatherman says. Can I just tell you, it really doesn't matter what the weatherman says. It will be what it is when it comes. I'm always amazed. I, I, I have a cousin who was a weatherman. He's retired now. But I asked him one time, I said, what's it, like to, what's it like to get paid to lie? And he looked at me, he says, I don't lie. I project what it might be. Yeah. I don't really know what, it, what it's going to be. I, I'm saying this is what it possibly could be. I'm not lying. I'm not saying for sure it's going to be minus 14. He's a funny guy. He is a funny guy. Don't be anxious about anything. And then look at what it says in the very last verse of this passage. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Where is your heart and your mind today? You see, it takes a daily choice to rejoice. But you can rejoice if you learn to trust Him in the day. And you know what? Tomorrow morning you get to try it all over again. Fresh start. Every morning is a fresh start. Just like His mercies are new every morning, so is your fresh start tomorrow morning. But can I just tell you, enjoy the present today. Use this present, this gift, this moment... Don't waste it. For some of you coming to church, you've come to church for a long time. Maybe some of you, it's the first time you've been to church. I don't know. Hebrews tells us over and over again, today if you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your heart. Because for some of you, you were saying, you were saying in the, in, for some of you, maybe you're saying that, is this Jesus thing real? Can I just tell you it's real? Maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, well, I'll, I'll sort it out next year. I think I'm going to get serious about Jesus this year. You know, I always love people who make these kind of New Year's resolutions. I'm going to read the Bible more next year. I'm going to pray more next year. I'm going, to, I'm going to help people more next year. You know what? Start today. Today is the day that the Lord has made. You don't have to wait till next year, even if it is only 13 hours away or 12 hours away. Start today. How about today? Do you realize that God loves you? 
He hasn't forsaken you. He sent His Son who, who lived a perfect life, who died and was placed on a cross, was placed in a tomb, and He rose again so that you might be saved. See, today is the day of salvation. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, you know, I got saved years ago and God has just been so great. But you know, he's really been pushing me lately in, in regards to this because there's this thing that God wants me to do and I haven't done it. And, and you know, God's really pushed me. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Can I just say do it today? If God's pushing you to do something, you need to start thinking about doing it. Not, not wait till tomorrow. Maybe it's calling somebody or doing something or maybe it's actually caring for someone. I believe God wants to do great things in our lives. I believe that 2024 is going to be a great year. But the reality is, today's a good day. Because it's the day the Lord made. I believe God wants to do great things in us. And it starts today. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will, be, I will rejoice and be glad in it. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Every day has enough trouble for itself and on its own. If you're thinking about tomorrow, thinking about next year, can I just help you to shift your mind back to the present? Maybe you're thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch. Can I just say, you're going to have something to eat, probably. It may not be what you're thinking about right this moment, but can I just tell you, you don't need to worry about it because God's got your life in his hand. You need to trust him. You need to seek him. You need to walk with him. See, when you wake up tomorrow, if the Lord gives you breath, it will be another day. And it will be the best day of your life. For the Lord made a new day. He gave you one more. For today is the day that the Lord has made. I'd like to encourage you to do these three things over the next year. Each day, take time to, to seek Him and trust Him, to Take opportunity to, to let those opportunities that come your way, make the most of them and rejoice and be glad in the day. And you may be sitting here and you're saying, you know, pastor, I've been praying for this thing and, and, and it hasn't happened. Well, maybe today's the day. Maybe there's some things that you wished had happened this year that didn't happen and you're kind of saying, but it didn't happen. Maybe it's today. I'm always, I'm always amazed at how God shows up when you least expect it. You know, I, I look back over our life and there have been so many times where God's shown up and done something that I just could not believe. You know, God is in the business of caring for us even when we don't care about ourselves. And I, I've watched how God has stepped into my life in times when I thought, God, like, I don't need this. And then I did. I'll never forget 
When my dad died, I was 14 years old, and about a month before he died, I got offered a job. I went into this restaurant pretty much every other day, if not every day, uh, when I was going to school. And I would go in, and there was this, this Chinese couple, Mr. and Mrs. Wu. And Mr. Wu was always friendly. He would always greet me and, and welcome me to the restaurant. And Mrs. Wu was always chatty and friendly. And it was about the middle of June, the first of June, somewhere in there of 1982. I was 14 years old and I walked into the restaurant this one day and Mr. Wu said to me, Mark, will you like job? And I said, Mr. Wu, I don't need a job. Mark, I give you a job. I give you a job. I said, but Mr. Wu, I don't, I don't need a job. He said, no, Mark, you need a job. Come work for me. I said, okay. So I started working for Mr. Wu. I worked two weeks. The restaurant was closed for a week, and the following week, my father passed away. I worked there for four years. God knew my need before I knew I had a need. You see, God knows you. He knows what you need before you need it. And he can take care of you before it happens. I worked there four years. Got me through high school. I helped my mom pay bills after my dad died. I walked that road of having to grow up. I wasn't even serving God when I got the job. Two years later, I gave my heart to the Lord and uh, my life was changed. Eventually I went to Bible college. But the crazy part is, is that God gave me, over and over, God gave them things I needed before I needed them. I had a job in the printing industry that paid me very, very well at that time. I was 18 years old and I was making more money than my brothers who were all much older than me. And God gave me a job when, a job I shouldn't have even had. Found favor with my boss. They kept giving me more money. They kept increasing my pay. And then God said, well, it's time to go to Bible college. And I was like, no, 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 God. Like, you just gave me this good job and it pays really well. And I don't mind giving my money to the church. Like, I'm quite happy. I don't need to go to Bible college. No, 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 it's time for the Bible college. Do you know that that job paid for my schooling? I never came out of Bible college with a debt. God took care of my need with something that I was good at. You see, God is always looking out for your needs long before you realize it. Long before you're able to see it. And God's already working it out. You, you need to seek Him and trust Him. And sometimes the waiting is the hard part. We wait and we go, God, when? When? And he's already working out the details. There are many moments that I can look back and I can see God's hand in my life. But the reality is we need to trust Him for today. I can look back and look at all those moments and say, yes, God, you, you met my need. You did that. But what do I need today? I don't know what your need is today, but God is not afraid to walk with you in that need. And he's not afraid to meet that need even today, the last day of this year. So I'm going to encourage you if you're here today and, and you just you just need something from God, I'm going to encourage you to come and find a place at this altar and pray and seek His face for a few minutes. Caleb will play. You don't need to rush out. But can I just say, seek Him for a few minutes? Rejoice in Him, because guess what? This is the day that the Lord has made.
This is the day. Would you stand with me this morning? One of the things I've learned is this. We can hope for stuff in the future, but there is nothing in next year that God can't do today. There's nothing that God can't do today which He doesn't have to wait till tomorrow or next year. God's in the business of doing things today. My Bible tells me that there is nothing, nothing is impossible for Him. Nothing. What you think is impossible, what you think is is an impossibility, what you think that God can't do, God can do it because nothing is impossible with Him. I'm living proof that nothing is impossible when it comes to God. Nothing is impossible with Him. So I'm going to encourage you uh, just to come. If you're waiting on the Lord for something, hey, you don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait till next year. He is here today and He wants to do what He wants to do. You see, when we start recognizing Him, He starts showing up in ways that we never thought He would. I encourage you to come. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank You today. Lord, we thank You for this day. We thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for today, oh God. We thank you for this day. Lord, we rejoice in this day because you have made. And Lord, we lift up our needs and our burdens and our problems and our challenges. But Lord, more importantly, we lift up praise to you for you, oh God, are worthy. You are a good God because that's who you are. You're a good father, oh God. That's who you are. And you love us. You love us. That's who, that's who we are. You love us because we are your children. And so today, Lord, we say yes to you. We say yes to the today. And Lord, we rejoice in today. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice in it. Yes, Lord. Father, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you for this this year, for all the things that have happened. Lord, for all the good things and even the bad, Lord, we rejoice in all that has happened because you, O God, are worthy of praise and honor and glory. Just encourage you, if you want prayer this morning, we're going to pray with you. If you need to go, feel free to go, but if you'd like to stay in an atmosphere of prayer and, and worship, you're welcome to stay. And we're just going to pray with anyone that wants prayer this morning. And just encourage you to enjoy this day. Because this is the day that the Lord has made.